It was another Friday evening, and although I arrived home late, my wife Victoria was even later. I wasn't particularly fond of her going out after work with her friends, but what could I do? It's important for couples to have separate lives outside of their marriage, and Victoria was considerate enough to keep me informed about her plans and return home early. Usually, she wouldn't be later than 8 p.m. This afternoon, while I was out on a job inspection, I received a text message from Victoria, out for drinks with the girls, home late. Love you. Generally, Victoria didn't go out often. It was more of a once-every-few-weeks occurrence. So why did it bother me so much? Well, that's a longer story. To keep it brief, let's just say I have trust issues, not specifically with females, but with anyone who spends time at bars with friends or goes on frequent business trips. Victoria happens to do both, but it's the trips that bother me the most. You might wonder why I have these issues and how they affect my perception of Victoria. Allow me to share a brief, somber tale so you can understand. I grew up in a bar, quite literally. My parents owned and ran the most popular bar in our small town near St. Louis, Missouri. They also operated an upscale French restaurant in the same building as the bar. People from miles around would come to dine at the restaurant and then head to the bar for a night of dancing. Growing up in that environment, I witnessed it all, and at a young age, my parents instilled in me the importance of discretion. When I turned 16, my parents decided it was time for me to learn the business. Both my older brother and sister had started working in the family business at 16. By the time I joined, my brother was 21 and managing the bar, while my sister, almost 19, was starting college. Of course, being so young, I wasn't allowed to work in the bar. Instead, I started busing tables in the restaurant. Initially, I resented the responsibility, as most teenagers would. I wanted to spend my time socializing with friends and making easy money doing something I enjoyed, ideally, in a place where I could flirt with attractive young women. However, my attitude started to shift after just three weeks of working in the restaurant. I turned to my sister Sarah, excitement coursing through me, and whispered, but sis, that's Mrs. Horton, and she's with another man. And she's not wearing any underwear. Do you think Mr. Horton knows? This is going to be the talk of the town. Sarah's expression shifted to one of concern, and she glanced nervously over her shoulder. Oh no, she muttered under her breath. Suddenly, I felt the weight of my father's hand on my shoulder, and he spoke firmly, Don, come with me, right now. With a sinking feeling, I followed him through the dining room, past the waiter's station, and into his office. I knew I was in for a serious discussion. As soon as we were inside, my father instructed me to close the door and take a seat. I braced myself for what was to come, feeling sick to my stomach as my father looked at me intently. Finally, he sighed and began to speak. Don, I should have had this conversation with you before allowing you to start working here, but I didn't. I've had to have this same talk with your brother and sister, and let me tell you, it doesn't get any easier with repetition. He paused for a moment before continuing, Mrs. Horton is a beautiful woman, isn't she, son? His unexpected question caught me off guard, and I felt a wave of dizziness wash over me. I nodded in agreement, whispering, yes. Leaning back in his chair, my father clasped his hands together and looked at me with a mixture of sadness and resolve. Son, this business is our life. It supports our family, provides for our home and education. But it's also delicate. We must exercise discretion at all times. When you're here, you see and hear only what you need to. If someone you know comes in with their family, you greet them warmly. But if they're with someone else, you maintain respectful distance. You see nothing, remember nothing, and certainly never discuss what you observe. We uphold strict rules of discretion here, my father continued, his tone serious. If any customer behaves inappropriately, we ignore it and never discuss it outside these walls. Every member of our staff is held to these standards. I've had to let go of some great employees over the years because they couldn't keep their mouths shut. Our reputation for discretion is as important as the quality of our food and service. Son, I know you're young and hormones are raging, he said, a hint of understanding in his voice. Even at my age, I admire a beautiful woman like Mrs. Horton. Your mother knows I do, and she knows you will too. 
but it's like window shopping. You look but never purchase or try on the merchandise. I don't expect you not to look, but I do expect discretion and subtlety. Another thing to remember, son, is that people like Mrs. Horton are usually found out, my father cautioned. Gossip spreads, and eventually, it reaches their spouse. Cheaters always slip up eventually. We don't want to contribute to something like that. Divorce can be devastating, especially for children. Now, back to work, and remember what I've said. I returned to my duties that day and continued working at the restaurant throughout high school and college. I witnessed too much infidelity for someone my age, but I never engaged in gossip. As I moved to busing the bar area, I observed married patrons engaging in behavior that wouldn't pass the spouse test. I learned to be intolerant of those who stayed out late on boys or girls' nights. Many business travelers would try to pick up locals, even if they were married. I felt disdain for their actions, but maintained professionalism and discretion. Those who left early often had stable marriages, while those who stayed late often faced marital troubles and divorce. In my freshman year of college, my father hired a new waitress named Victoria. I was instantly infatuated with her, and over the next two years, we fell in love. We shared values, laughed at the antics of cheaters, and knew we were meant for each other. The only obstacle in our relationship was our parents' request for a prenuptial agreement. Vicky and I were confident in our commitment to each other, but our parents insisted on a prenuptial agreement. Surprisingly, both sets of parents had substantial assets they wanted to protect in case of divorce. The agreement ensured that anything we owned before marriage or inherited would remain ours in the event of a split. It also addressed pensions, child care arrangements, and custody if we were to divorce with minor children. After graduating, Vicky secured a position in finance at a local stock brokerage firm while I pursued a career in construction management and landscape architecture. My parents ran the family restaurant business, and I eventually started my own construction and landscaping company with financial support from them. Vicky's job required some travel, which made me uneasy due to my upbringing. As my business flourished, I grew accustomed to Vicky's occasional travel. Meanwhile, I managed my construction company, gradually expanding its scope and earning a larger salary. Despite occasional nights out with my employees, I ensured I returned home promptly, unlike Vicky's occasional evenings with friends. Our relationship was built on trust and mutual understanding, even with the occasional discomfort about each other's activities. Three years into our marriage, Vicky and I decided to start a family. Our first child, Patrick, was followed by little Suzanne 18 months later. She was petite but had a strong personality, resembling her mother more each day. It was clear she would be a heartbreaker as she grew older. As Vicky excelled in her job, she became known for her ability to solve problems in difficult offices. She wasn't afraid to confront issues head-on and escalate them if needed. Her expertise led to more frequent travel, which neither of us enjoyed, but we agreed to endure it until she could secure a promotion that would reduce her travel time. Meanwhile, my construction business faced challenges due to the economic downturn. We had to take on smaller projects to stay afloat after laying off half of our employees. Despite our financial stability, the downturn affected our profitability. One fateful Thursday morning, a seemingly routine inquiry from Mrs. Sloan about a deck and landscaping project triggered a chain of events that would unravel my marriage. Mrs. Sloan's resemblance to a past infatuation left me speechless, igniting feelings I thought were long buried. I greeted Mrs. Sloan with a smile and introduced myself as Don Patterson. After a moment of confusion, I apologized for my reaction, explaining that she reminded me of someone from my past. Mrs. Sloan, or Jasmine as she preferred to be called, chuckled and revealed her identity as the daughter of Danita and Alfred Horton, regular patrons of my family's restaurant when she was younger. As we reminisced about old times, Jasmine explained that she and her husband Stephen were looking to build a deck, cabana, and hot tub in their new home. Intrigued by the prospect of working with my construction business, she invited me to visit her house to discuss the project further. Due to some delays, I arrived at the Sloan's residence later than planned. Apologizing for my tardiness, Jasmine assured me that it was not an issue and offered me a drink before we proceeded to inspect the backyard. After taking measurements, I explained the need for the hot tub dimensions before finalizing the bid. Jasmine seemed surprised that I expected her to provide the hot tub, assuming it would be included in the bid. 
I clarified that I could include it, but knowing the tub's dimensions beforehand would facilitate the ordering of materials. I chuckled and explained to Jasmine the details involved in purchasing a hot tub, including size, power requirements, and installation type. Seeing her distress, I suggested postponing the decision until she could discuss it with her husband, who was away on a business trip. However, Jasmine seemed hesitant to involve her husband in the decision, insisting on handling it herself. After gathering more information about their usage habits, we visited a supplier where Jasmine chose a smaller tub suitable for her needs. Returning to her home, Jasmine offered me access to their home office for internet connectivity, as her husband worked remotely. Entering the office, I was impressed by its setup, resembling a professional workspace with a desk, leather chairs, and a view of the backyard. While setting up my laptop, I noticed a framed picture on the desk, catching my attention. Jasmine, noticing my reaction, inquired about my sudden change in demeanor. I hesitated, then picked up the picture, realizing it depicted her husband with another woman. Stunned, I asked Jasmine if her husband was indeed in Denver. Jasmine's surprise was evident as I revealed the unsettling truth about the picture on her husband's desk. She insisted she hadn't consulted Stephen about the estimates, merely following his advice regarding the budget. However, my revelation left her bewildered. Upon realizing that the woman in the picture was my wife, Jasmine seemed taken aback but composed. She mentioned their relatively short marriage of 18 months and questioned the timeline of the photograph. My stomach turned as I explained that the picture was recent, indicating a potential overlap in relationships. Emotions ran high as Jasmine processed the revelation, her distress palpable. I urged her to consider the situation calmly, drawing from my experience of witnessing similar scenarios in the restaurant business. Despite the apparent evidence, I cautioned against hasty conclusions, acknowledging the complexities of human relationships. As we grappled with the uncertainty, I couldn't help but feel torn between confronting the issue and preserving the trust one had always placed in my wife. The dilemma weighed heavily on both of us, leaving us unsure of the next course of action. We deliberated further and devised what we deemed a reasonable course of action. Both Jasmine and I agreed to keep our suspicions to ourselves for the time being. Jasmine would refrain from informing Steve about our conversation regarding the deck, and we would hire a private investigator to discreetly monitor Vicky and Steve's activities. The following day, we contacted the security firm we often utilized for our construction projects, who referred us to a reputable investigation company. After meeting with their representatives and arranging for their services, we each provided a retainer fee and returned home. Jasmine ensured discretion by abbreviating the recipient's name on her check, while I utilized our business account, which Vicky was not involved in managing. After three weeks, Jasmine and I reconvened with the investigator to receive their findings. To my relief, the investigator reported that there was no evidence suggesting any improper relationship between our spouses. While there was a minor incident involving Vicky dancing with Steve at a bar, it appeared entirely innocent. As I absorbed this information, I couldn't help but reflect on the paranoia that had consumed me, likely stemming from my past experiences. Despite thorough investigations, including monitoring phone records and placing surveillance devices, nothing incriminating had been uncovered. However, a sudden realization struck me as Jasmine mentioned Steve's upcoming trip to San Antonio. I recalled Vicky mentioning her own scheduled compliance review trip to Austin, Texas, during the same time frame. Considering their proximity during these travels, I proposed that we continue surveillance during this period. If they remained above suspicion afterward, I would acknowledge my unfounded suspicions and attribute them to paranoia. After all, it was plausible that if they were merely old acquaintances, Vicky might have innocently posed for a photograph with Steve and his trophy. Throughout the uncertainty and the ongoing investigation, Don and Jasmine noticed no discernible change in the behavior of either Vicky or Steve towards them. They remained as they always had been. Don racked his brain but couldn't pinpoint any differences in Vicky's demeanor from their dating days or early marriage. She continued to show him love and affection, initiating intimacy as she always had and remaining considerate and attentive. On a Friday night before Vicky's upcoming trip, Don and she enjoyed a cozy dinner date followed by intimate moments in bed. Later, as they lay together, Don broached a topic that had been on his mind. Vicky, do you remember our days at Dad's restaurant 
laughing at all the cheaters and inappropriate behavior, he asked, sensing a subtle tension in her muscles. Vicky smiled, turning her face towards him. Yes, some people really did foolish things back then. Sometimes, when I see similar behavior at work, I think back to those times and realize how senseless it all is. Why do you ask? Don recounted a conversation he had with a colleague who suspected his wife of infidelity but lacked concrete evidence. I reassured him, reminded him that cheaters are eventually exposed. Delaying the discovery can spare the children from the pain of divorce, Don explained. Vicky's expression shifted slightly, and she offered a different perspective. But Don, not all affairs lead to divorce. Perhaps the wife still loves her husband and the affair doesn't hold the same significance for her. Maybe she doesn't want to end the marriage. Don disagreed, citing his colleague's staunch stance against infidelity. He's similar to us, with little tolerance for cheating. I doubt he'd accept a long-term affair any more than we would. Maybe if it were a one-time thing, but not an ongoing affair, Don asserted. Although Vicky tensed momentarily at Don's mention of refusing to accept a long-term affair, she quickly composed herself, giving him a tender kiss. I'm glad you're still the man I married. We understand the pain caused by blatant affairs. If your colleague needs support, bring him to us. Good night, honey, she said. As they settled into bed, neither Don nor Vicky found it easy to fall asleep, their minds preoccupied with thoughts and concerns. The following week proved challenging for Don as he anxiously awaited updates from the investigators. Despite contacting them twice, all he received was a reassuring yet inconclusive response, our agents are monitoring both individuals and will provide a comprehensive report next Monday. Monday arrived, and Jasmine and Don headed to the investigator's office, bracing themselves for potentially grim news. As they settled into their seats, an air of unease hung in the room. The investigator, appearing somber, began, I must admit, when you requested surveillance on your spouses last week, I had doubts about the outcome. This proved to be one of our most challenging infidelity cases. Steve and Vicky are indeed involved in an affair. We have photographic evidence and recorded conversations to support this. His revelation stunned them. What's surprising, he continued, is the level of cunning displayed by both parties. They meticulously orchestrated their rendezvous, meeting discreetly in cities far from here, feigning chance encounters. They went to great lengths to conceal their trysts, booking separate hotel rooms connected by a connecting door. Steve paid in cash, leaving no paper trail, while Vicky used an alias and a fake ID. Don processed the information. Foster was Vicky's maiden name, Victoria Angela Foster, he murmured. And Alan is Steve's middle name, Jasmine added. With a heavy sigh, Don resigned, it seems our marriage is beyond repair. I'll consult a divorce attorney at the earliest opportunity. Just as they contemplated their next steps, the investigator interjected with an unexpected twist. Hold on, there's more. I don't typically delve into this, but I can't shake the feeling that there's more to this than meets the eye. Yes, they engaged in sexual activity, but the nature of their interaction seems peculiar, almost like they were playing a game. Let me play a tape for you. It might shed some light on the situation. As the tape played, Vicky's voice filled the room. She expressed reservations about their affair, hinting at the possibility of it coming to an end. She cited Don's words from their conversation on Friday night, acknowledging the inherent risks of infidelity and expressing regret over their recent encounter in Denver. The recording left them perplexed, casting doubt on the true nature of Steve and Vicky's relationship. It seemed their affair was not as straightforward as it appeared, raising more questions than answers. I understand that managing two rooms and footing the bill for an unused one can be bothersome, but I truly believe we've achieved our objective. We've proven ourselves as smart cheaters, demonstrating that strategic planning can lead to successful deceit. I have no intention of jeopardizing my relationship with Don. I love him dearly. He's the best man I've ever known. Frankly, after our initial encounters, the thrill of the affair waned for me. I found more excitement in the scheming and plotting than in the actual physical aspect. Planning the deceptions, obtaining false IDs, arranging travel, it's like solving a challenging puzzle. The sex itself barely ignites any passion. And don't give me that macho act, I know you feel the same way. 
Remember in Denver when you confessed your dissatisfaction with your hotel rendezvous? As the investigator paused the recording, he looked perplexed. There's more to this, but this part is particularly puzzling to me. I can't quite grasp why. Interrupting, Don burst into laughter. Regaining his composure, he explained, I apologize for laughing. This isn't a laughing matter, and I'm furious. But there's something about that conversation you should know. Years ago, a couple we knew went through a divorce due to the wife's infidelity. She had been cheating for nearly four years before being caught, and it was a minor oversight that exposed her. One night, while discussing infidelity with friends, Vicky insisted that smart cheaters could evade detection if they were clever enough. I argued vehemently, citing my father's wisdom from our days at the restaurant. I maintained that cheaters always get caught eventually, even if it takes years. Vicky was adamant, boasting about her intellect. I believe this affair with Steve began around that time. Vicky's always taken pride in her intelligence, and I fear I may have inadvertently provoked her into proving herself. She could have succeeded if she had ended it sooner. But now, she won't get away with it. Don and Jasmine found themselves united once more, this time awaiting their appointment with a divorce attorney. Having already split the investigator's costs, they decided to share legal representation. As Don entered the attorney's office, George Spaulding, the attorney, greeted them with surprise. Mr. Patterson, and this is... Mrs. Patterson? Chuckling, Don clarified, No, sir. I'm Don Patterson, and this is Jasmine Sloan. We discovered that her husband and my wife were having an affair and split the investigator's fees to gather evidence. Now, we thought we might be able to split your fee too. George Spaulding smiled, motioning them to take a seat. Certainly. Let's see what we can arrange. Please, have a seat while we discuss. Don sat down and passed the attorney a folder containing the investigator's report and accompanying photos. Before the attorney could examine them, Don spoke up. I don't anticipate my case being too complicated. I've also brought a comprehensive list detailing all assets owned by Vicky and me, along with their acquisition dates and methods. Additionally, here's a copy of our prenuptial agreement outlining the property division and custody arrangements for the children. All I'm seeking is a divorce based on adultery and a settlement in accordance with the prenup. However, Jasmine's situation might be more intricate. As Don's attorney reviewed the paperwork, Jasmine handed over similar documents for herself, albeit lacking a prenuptial agreement. After explaining the divorce process, time frame, and fee structure, the attorney delved into Jasmine's desires for a divorce settlement, if feasible. Finally, he concluded, I believe I have sufficient information for now. I'll need to examine all the documentation and the investigator's report. If any questions arise, I'll reach out, naturally. Otherwise, I'll draft the necessary paperwork and proceed accordingly. Would you prefer I serve the papers directly or inform you beforehand? Both Don and Jasmine opted to be notified before the papers were served. They departed the office and agreed to stay in touch. Two days later, Don received a call from George Spaulding. After exchanging pleasantries, George got straight to the point. Don, I've reviewed everything you provided, and I must say... This is the most peculiar case I've encountered. I even had two of my colleagues examine it, and they concur. There's indisputable evidence of infidelity, but it seems apparent that the woman loves you. Frankly, it doesn't even resemble a typical affair. It's almost as if it were a game they felt compelled to play. Are you certain you want to proceed with the divorce? Considering all you've described, your marriage appeared nearly flawless. You rarely argued, your intimate life was thriving, and you seemed to genuinely care for each other. Don, forgive my frankness, but it almost seems as though you're playing along as well. It's your move now, and divorce seems to be the only option available. Can't you sit down with Vicky and work through this? I've listened to the tapes, and she's told Steve they need to end it, admitting it was merely a game to her. Don pondered for a moment before responding to George. No, George. I've asked myself that very question, and at one point, I believed it might have been possible. If it were merely a game without physical intimacy, if they'd engaged in an emotional affair or even a fictitious one, I might have been able to overlook it. 
Initially, it could have been Vicky's reaction to my criticism of her belief in smart cheaters. She couldn't accept my assertion that there are no such cheaters and that getting caught was inevitable. If she hadn't crossed the line and allowed Steve to be intimate with her, I could have forgiven her infidelity. But this has persisted for too long. I mean, six years. Despite the lackluster sex and their inferior enjoyment compared to Jasmine and me, it still constitutes adultery, and she must face the consequences. George let out a sigh and remarked, Well, it's your decision. I just regret having to assist you through this. The paperwork is all set for filing. When do you want to proceed with serving her? Don grinned slightly and replied, George, she's currently on the East Coast with Steve this week. They're expected back late Friday afternoon. Could we arrange for her to be served at her workplace on Friday? Her flight lands around noon, so she should be at her office by 3.30 or 4. I'd like her to receive the papers along with a tape I've prepared for her. It contains their conversation about ending things. You can listen to it, but at the end, I've added a message, you lose. Like I said, cheaters always slip up and get caught. On Friday morning, Don gathered all his crews in his office before they departed for their work sites. He informed them about the impending divorce and its reasons. Don instructed them not to take orders from Vicky and to refrain from discussing any business matters or his personal life with her. As they left, Laura, his secretary, expressed her condolences, remarking, Don, I'm truly sorry. I can't believe Vicky would do something like this. I still remember how passionately she condemned cheaters. Laura chuckled before adding, I mean, the comments she used to make whenever we spotted someone we knew doing something like that, damn. At 4.10 that afternoon, Don received a call from the attorney, confirming that the papers had been served. Then, around 4.30, the phone rang again, and Don saw Vicky's name on the caller ID. Taking a deep breath, Don answered, Hello, Vicky. He heard sobbing on the other end, followed by a faint, trembling voice pleading, Don, please, can't we move past this? You know I love you with all my heart. I realize how foolish I've been now, but you infuriated me that night with your superior attitude, berating me for suggesting a smart cheater could evade detection. For the first year, it was all about proving we could do it. You heard me telling Steve I didn't love him and that the sex wasn't even satisfying. We were planning to end it. Please, Don, don't do this to us. I still can't believe you found out after all those years. I'd love to know how you managed it. Vicky, I didn't create this situation. You did. Now, I have to bring it to an end. I thought we were both in complete agreement about cheating and affairs. I thought, well, I knew neither of us condoned cheating. We agreed that cheaters would face the consequences eventually. I just can't fathom how you could justify this, knowing how we both feel. Don decided to offer Vicky some insight into how he discovered the affair. Vicky, I wasn't planning on revealing how I caught you, but now I feel it's necessary. Remember that Thursday before you returned from Denver? Jasmine Sloan visited the office, seeking our assistance in building a deck and landscaping her backyard. She allowed me to use Steve's office, where I stumbled upon the picture of you with him and the trophy from the state classic Chevrolet car show. Jasmine mentioned that you were one of Steve's former girlfriends. Initially, I almost believed her, until I realized the picture seemed recent, considering your appearance and the jewelry and clothing you were wearing. At first, I was inclined to dismiss my suspicions, assuming you two had dated before we were together and coincidentally ran into each other at the car show. However, after further discussion with Jasmine and learning that both of you were in Denver that week, we decided to hire an investigator to follow you. The following month, we observed your activities, and apart from a dance during your girls' night out, there was no contact between you and Steve. We were on the verge of dropping the investigation, attributing it to a mere coincidence, until I recalled Jasmine mentioning that Steve was going to San Antonio while you claimed to be in Austin. So, we decided to monitor you both during that week. And well, we did uncover something, didn't we? Don could hear Vicky sniffling on the other end of the line before she spoke. Don? Don, I love you deeply. I don't want to lose you. Can't you find it in your heart to forgive me, just this once? With a sigh, Don responded, No, honey, I'm afraid I can't. At least not at the moment. 
I might have been able to if you hadn't been intimate with him, but I just can't overlook that and the duration of the affair. But, darling, please understand, it wasn't really an affair. It was more like a game. I just needed to prove a point. And the sex, well, it was simply because we were away from home and things got heated. It was almost like using each other for sexual release. We never made love or professed love to each other. It was always about the game, and then in the last four years, it was just about physical satisfaction. Vicky, it doesn't change anything. What matters is that it happened. You planned to betray my trust, and you succeeded. You had to arrange meetings with Steve somewhere, and I wouldn't be surprised if it happened during one of your girls' nights out, did it? We danced a few more times that night and eventually decided to give it a try. I learned that he traveled as a manufacturer's rep, and he learned about my compliance reviews. We realized we'd be in the same area about three weeks later, so we agreed to meet. That's when we started planning what we thought was a perfect, non-sexual affair. We made a pact never to contact each other at home or on our personal phones. We mostly used disposable phones and only called each other from work or during lunch breaks to arrange our next meetings. I got fake IDs and a new credit card with the bill sent to a P.O. box near my parents' home, which I visited often enough to check the mail. We thought we had covered all our tracks, except for the picture. I had no idea he had it taken. Vicky let out a half-hearted laugh and continued, I guess it's true what they say, just one small slip can bring a cheater down. I'm truly sorry, honey. I guess I got so caught up in the excitement. I love you. With that, Don heard the click as Vicky ended the call. Surprised to find tears streaming down his cheeks, Don leaned back in his chair to reflect. He didn't even notice when Laura wished him good night. His next memory was the realization that it was already dark outside. Before the divorce was finalized, both sets of parents made separate attempts to dissuade Don from divorcing Vicky. Perhaps the most heartfelt plea came from Vicky's parents. They called him one Saturday and asked if they could visit him and the children at his house, to which he agreed. After spending some time with the children, the three adults sat in the shade, watching the kids play in the pool. Vicky's mother turned to Don and said, Don, we all know that our daughter has made a complete fool of herself. When she first came to our home that night, she was utterly devastated. She was in hysterics and could barely articulate what had happened. We finally managed to calm her down enough to hear her story. She showed us all the evidence you had against her. Don, I must admit, if I had caught her father doing what she did, I would have left him too. But can't you consider doing what I ask, instead of following my lead? I can see how much she loves you, every time she looks at you, talks about you, or sees a picture of you. Her problem lies in her intellectual arrogance. She's always been the brightest woman in the room, and she felt she had to prove she could get away with something like this. Don, did you ever stop to think that perhaps you inadvertently pushed her to do this? She told me about the argument you had about your friends just before she decided to prove she could have an affair without getting caught. Don glanced at his mother-in-law and admitted, Yes, Mona, I've considered that I might have played a part in her affair. If she had just met him without crossing that line, maybe I could have forgiven her. You know how strongly we both felt about cheating before we got married. You know how insistent she was about the clauses in the prenuptial agreement regarding infidelity. And then she did something like this. No, I just can't let it go. It's tearing me apart, but I just can't. The divorce was eventually settled, and Don found solace in the existence of the prenuptial agreement. They had to divide some investments and their shared property, including the house. Since Don's business was under the family name, and the shares he owned were considered gifts, Vicky didn't have a claim to it. Don allowed Vicky to take her share of the house's value from their investment account so he could own it outright. Despite the pain, Don remained civil whenever he encountered Vicky and ensured she had access to their children without any trouble. Though he still yearned to hold her when they met, he knew he could never trust her again. One day, while having dinner with his children at the restaurant, Don noticed Jasmine entering the building. She seemed hesitant, and Don hurriedly approached her before she could be seated. Jasmine, it's great to see you, Don greeted her warmly. I noticed you told Patty you were alone. If you'd like, I only have my children with me. 
We could share a table. Jasmine paused for a moment before smiling. Don felt a sense of relief wash over him as she approached him, giving him a quick hug and a kiss on the cheek. Thank you, she said softly. I think I'd like that. I've been feeling so alone since. Once seated, Don introduced Jasmine to his children. Before Jasmine could even look at the menu, Don's father appeared beside their table, exclaiming, Don, have you been hiding someone from me? Who is this lovely lady? Don chuckled, and Jasmine offered a smile. Turning to his father, Don explained, Dad, this is Jasmine Sloan. Her husband, uh, her mother was Danita Horton. They used to come in here when I was a kid. Mr. Patterson nodded, recognizing the connection. Ah, uh, yes, I remember now. You resemble your mother so much, I can't believe I didn't recognize you. How are your parents? It's been years since I've seen them. Jasmine replied, they're both doing well, I suppose. I talk to Dad on the phone occasionally. After the divorce, he moved to Kansas City. I visit Mother a couple of times a month. She lives north of town. Enjoy your evening, Mr. Patterson said warmly. I hope you'll come back more often now that you've remembered where we are. After Jasmine placed her order, Don turned to her and apologized. How have you been? I'm sorry I haven't called more, but summer is always hectic for me. I guess I could have made time. I'm sorry. Oh, don't worry about it, Jasmine reassured him. I understand how busy you've been, and truthfully, I haven't reached out much either. Actually, I'm here tonight to celebrate. Steve finally gave in, and my divorce was finalized today. We had to sell the house and split everything evenly. He fought against alimony and dragged out the divorce proceedings, but since he was the one who didn't want me to work, I eventually came out on top. I had to settle for a small apartment for now, but once I find a job, I'll be able to afford something better. As the evening progressed, Don and Jasmine found themselves engrossed in conversation, ordering a second bottle of wine. Eventually, Don noticed their children becoming restless. I suppose I should head out before these two wreak havoc and get us banned from here, he remarked with a chuckle. It's been wonderful catching up with you. Perhaps we could do this again sometime? Jasmine nodded with a smile. I'd like that. Let's. She signaled the waitress for the bill, only to find out it had already been paid. Don chuckled. That old rascal. I usually foot the bill, and he knows it. I think he's trying to play matchmaker. After leaving a tip, he stood up. Come on, kids. Say goodnight to your grandparents and let's head home. Don offered Jasmine his arm as they left the restaurant. May I escort you to your chariot, my lady? He joked. Jasmine accepted his arm with a smile. You may, good sir. While waiting for the children, Don expressed his reluctance for the night to end. I was hoping to relax by the pool once I got home, he confessed. All I had to look forward to was a quiet night with the kids. Jasmine shared his sentiment. Me too, except I don't have a pool at my apartment and I don't have any children. Don't worry. It's still early. Would you like to come over to our place and chat some more after I tuck these two into bed? Don offered. Jasmine nodded eagerly. Yes, I'd love that. After putting the children to bed, Don set up a cooler with drinks by the pool. They both grabbed a drink and settled into their chairs. Don looked at the shimmering water and sighed. You know, I think your mother played a role in my divorce. I... Oh, damn it, I'm sorry, Jasmine. I shouldn't have said that. I was just thinking. Well, you see. Jasmine's expression turned to one of concern. Don reached out, wiping a tear from her eye. Let me explain myself. I made a fool of myself just now. He recounted a memory from when he was 16, working at the restaurant and seeing Jasmine's mother with another man. I always thought your mother was the most beautiful woman in the world until I met you, he admitted. I couldn't take my eyes off her, and my father noticed. He overheard me talking about telling my friends what I saw. Wow, I still vividly recall the scolding and lecture I received that night in his office, Don reminisced. 
I believe that evening heavily influenced my views on marital fidelity to this day. Interestingly, Vicky later joined our team and received the same lecture. We used to discuss our experiences and observations from working at the restaurant. I thought we both shared my father's philosophy. Perhaps I was too staunch about fidelity for my own good. I've been reflecting, and seeing your mother that night might have set me on the rigid path I followed throughout this affair. I'm sorry, and to answer your question, no, no one in my family or our staff revealed your mother's actions. I don't know who did, but it was nearly a year before your parents divorced, and as far as I know, that was the only time she and her companion were at the restaurant. Jasmine looked at Don thoughtfully. Well, perhaps something positive stemmed from that ordeal, or maybe not, depending on perspective. You see, she married that man, and they remained together until his tragic death in a car accident several years ago. Though I suspect she was unfaithful to him as well. They say once a cheater, always a cheater. Once Jasmine had regained her composure, Don returned to his seat, and they shifted the conversation to lighter topics. He discovered Jasmine had an accounting degree and had worked in the field for a while. He chuckled to himself, recalling his mother's complaints about needing more time off due to her dual roles of managing the bar and restaurant's books and overseeing the waitstaff. He also pondered hiring assistance for Laura. Perhaps. The following Wednesday, Don had barely returned home from work when he heard urgent knocking on the door. Opening it, he was surprised when Jasmine practically threw herself into his arms, tearfully expressing gratitude. Your parents offered me a job, she explained amidst sobs. I went for the interview, passed the test, and they hired me. I start tomorrow. They're paying me too generously, and... Her voice trailed off as she broke down again, and Don simply held her close, soothing her with gentle strokes of her hair. In the ensuing months, Don and Jasmine grew increasingly closer. Don began taking the kids to the restaurant for supper frequently, often timing their visits so Jasmine could join them. Christmas and New Year's Eve were spent together, and by then, they were recognized as a couple. Every invitation extended to one automatically included the other. On Valentine's Day, amidst the bustling atmosphere of the restaurant, Don approached Jasmine. Could you come to the bar for a moment? He asked. The band is on break, and I need your help on stage. Jasmine agreed, and as they reached the stage, Don positioned her by the microphone stand while he knelt down. I need some light over here, he called out, tugging at the stand's bass. Then, raising his voice, he said, Hey, can you shine a light for me? Jasmine scanned the room, searching for a light source, when suddenly a spotlight illuminated both of them. Don's voice echoed through the room as he addressed her. Jasmine, he began, his request broadcasted by the microphone. Looking down at him, Jasmine noticed he was extending something toward her. In the bright lights, it appeared to be a black square, possibly a part of the microphone stand. As Jasmine reached for the item, Don continued speaking. Jasmine, I'm down here, humbling myself before you. I'm begging you. Will you marry me? You've brought light back into my life, and I only find true happiness when I'm with you. Just as Jasmine's fingers made contact with the box, she processed Don's words. She closed her hands around the box and stammered, What? Did you say? Opening the small box, Jasmine beheld a stunning ring nestled inside. Her eyes widened in astonishment, and she instinctively brought her hand to her mouth. With trembling hands, she lifted the ring from its container and slowly slid it onto her left ring finger, tears streaming down her cheeks. Overwhelmed with emotion, she dropped to her knees and pulled Don into a deep, passionate kiss. Yes, she whispered between kisses. Oh yes. I love you with all my heart, and I've dreamt for months that you loved me too. The room erupted in cheers and applause. When Jasmine finally came up for air, she found herself surrounded by Don's family. His brother embraced her, and she was passed from person to person as they shared in the joyous moment. Jasmine and Don set a date for their wedding in June. Over the following months, Jasmine gradually moved her belongings from her small apartment into Don's home. At the wedding reception, as they opened their gifts, they discovered a weathered envelope at the bottom of the pile. Inside was a heart-shaped valentine, its original signature erased. It seemed to have been from Don. 
Written on the valentine were heartfelt words, I received this valentine from the only man I ever loved on our first Valentine's Day. I have treasured it ever since. Somehow, it seems fitting to pass it on to you now. May your lives be filled with love and consideration for one another. May you never break each other's hearts or let foolish pride tear you apart. Congratulations. I wish you both a lifetime of love and happiness. With all my love, Victoria. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel not to miss new videos.